Welcome to On Topic, a series of conversations with experts, distinguished scholars, and practitioners on issues of importance to Alaska. I'm Jim Johnson, president of the University of Alaska. And in this segment, we explore the topic of technology and higher education with my guest, Jamie Cassip, chief education evangelist at Google. In his work at Google, Jamie focuses the powers of technology and the web on the pursuit of promoting inquiry-driven learning models. Jamie collaborates with school systems, educational organizations, and leaders to build innovation into our education policies and practices. Jamie is also an author and serves on a number of boards for organizations focused on education, innovation, and equity. He teaches a 10th grade communication class at the Phoenix Coding Academy and is an adjunct professor at Arizona State University where he teaches classes on policy, innovation, and leadership. Welcome to On Topic, Jamie Cassip. You know, I, I, I read a lot in the classics, or you used to anyway, and Janus is the, the Roman god of entries and exits, and has also been adapted to be the god of technology. Uh, and, and of course, Janus is a two-faced god, uh, you know, looking backward, looking forward. Mm -hmm. And with technology, there are many aspects of it, right? right. Uh, there's, you know, the, the opportunities that technology provides, and then uh, there's, you know, the social side of it. Right. Uh, and how do you see those, those two aspects of technology? Often technology is, ex exists decades and decades before it's, it's ever Mm -hmm. actually implemented and accepted. Right. How do you see, because you operate in, at that space a little yeah. bit, um, how do you see those things working together or not yeah. uh, in your work? All right, so we're diving right into it, huh? Yeah. Okay, so I get the question all the time about the, the evil side of technology, mm -hmm. if you will. And I always like to remind people that that's true for everything, mm -hmm. right? You know, if you think about medicine, medicine is an unbelievably good thing, mm -hmm. but there's an evil side to medicine, right? There's drug abuse and those types of things. Transportation has been great. Money, you know, anything that we've ever invented has mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that doesn't have both sides. Mm -hmm. Electricity is an amazing invention, yet, you know, people use electricity to make bombs, right? right. So it's it everything has two sides to it. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to think about <clears throat> when it comes to technology is how do we use it for good, but then how do we teach people why it's good? Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you think about, you know, my life when I was 11 years old, if you asked me a question like, you know, what happened on December 7th, 1941? Mm -hmm. And if I didn't know the answer, I'd say, I don't know. I will come back tomorrow and I will tell you. Mm -hmm. I would have to go find the answer somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, either an encyclopedia, and I didn't have encyclopedias, right? Like I, didn't, I grew up poor. I didn't. I well, I had the M. You know, I had the the one that they <laughs> dropped off for the nine ninety nine price. So I didn't have encyclopedias. So if you had an M question, I could answer it. But mm -hmm. I would have to go to the library to get the answer. And that library closed at five o'clock in the afternoon. It wasn't open on the weekends. And if I was looking for, it took forever to get that information. Right. Today. That is no longer true, right? Mm -hmm. I, I have a hundred million Columbus libraries in my pocket. That is powerful. And it also leads to this whole idea that I've been talking about lately around the speed at which learning can happen today, mm -hmm. right? When information is a commodity, when information has no value, what is valuable is the next level, the next stage, and that's intelligence. And mm -hmm. so I can't even imagine what the world is gonna look like 100 years from now if we continue to use technology and the, invention and the advancement of digitalization in, to do good work. Like, what is what is the world going to look like 100 years from now? Hopefully much better. But like, you know, we're looking at issues like climate change. How are we right. going to solve climate change? I think we're looking at how do we solve climate change with the way we did things right. as opposed to what's coming. Like, I can't even imagine what the next 10 years are going to be like in terms of how we're going to be able to solve some of these problems. Mm -hmm. I think those solutions are going to appear because learning can happen so much faster. And this is uh, right off the bat, I'm going to sound a little bit crazy. But, you know, if you think about what the world looked like 150 years ago, right? And what the environment looked like, what transportation looked like, what medicine looked like, what medical practice looked like, what technology looked like, what, what everything looked like 150 years ago. And think about what we have today with lights, electricity, technology, all the things that we have. And recognize and realize that everything that we have in front of us right now was available to us 150 years ago, right? This stuff was always there. 
It, it's not like some spaceship crash landed 10 mm -hmm. years ago and dropped off all this modern technology. Mm -hmm. We're using the exact same resources that were available to us 150 years ago. Why didn't we invent these things 150 years ago? Is because learning took so long, right? Mm -hmm. Learning took longer to get through. It took longer, you know, you went through step one and then step two and stuff. Mm -hmm. Today, learning can happen at such a lightning speed. I can't even imagine what the world's gonna look like 20, 30, 40 years from now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I tend to be positive about technology. I tend to be positive about what we can do with this, mostly because I think that information has always been used as a power grab, a power tool, something mm -hmm. that people, if you had information, you had power. Whoever held the information, you read right. in the classics, right? right? Whoever could read and write held That's the right. power. That's right. Well, today, what, what, what does the world look like when everyone has access to the same information? Mm -hmm. And there's going to be forces that are going to try to knock that down. There's going to be forces to try to make that evil. Mm -hmm. I think we're just going to have to overcome them. Mm -hmm. Chief Education Evangelist. Yeah. Talk about that. How did you get... Google to say, yeah, great idea, Jamie, or right. did they come up with it? But talk about that that role that you play in the company. Yeah, so I have an unusual role at Google because it kind of all happened by accident. And what I mean by that is first, I just celebrated my 13th year at Google. I've never done anything for 13 years. I can't believe I'm still there. But I, 13 years at Google and I started in the engineering space. And what happened was we ended up being, uh, we had an office in Phoenix on the ASU campus. And I was working for the CIO in the engineering space. And he said, look, ASU is going to come at you with like a thousand different project ideas. Like, I'm sure that if a big tech company landed on your campus, you'd have a thousand ideas mm -hmm. and things to work on. My job was to go find the right projects for Google to be interested in. Mm -hmm. So I met with all the leaders on campus. And when I met with the CIO of uh, Arizona State University, Adrian Sainer, I asked him what his biggest problem was. And his biggest problem at that time in 2006 was email. Mm -hmm. He had 60,000 students. None of them were using their, their provided email accounts. They were all using their own. So he says, I have no idea which, where students are. I have no idea what their emails are. I have professors trying to collect student information, you know, and you had students with like, you know, hot chick 69 at yahoo.com, you know, like all these crazy, you know, nothing professional about it all. You couldn't keep track, couldn't communicate. And I said, hey, we got this tool internally called Google for your domain where you can actually build your email platform on top of ours. And he wanted to learn more about it. Two weeks later, we set up a meeting. And then two weeks after that, we had launched Google Apps for Education at Arizona State University. And I remember walking up the mall campus going, this can have a huge impact on, on education and the role that technology plays. So I got more involved and more interested in it. Then a year into that, I said, this could have a huge impact in K-12 education as well. So I started working with states. And so I, I worked with the state of Oregon and we signed a state level agreement to bring Google Apps to the state of Oregon. And in all that kind of year and a half work, I was doing a lot of presentations, a lot of awareness things, and I did a presentation in Michigan. And the executive director of technology and education for the state of Michigan saw me speak. And when I got off the stage, and my title at that point was, you know, business manager or education manager, some you know generic corporate title. And he's like, you're not, you're not a business manager. You are an evangelist because of the way I talked about education, the way I talked about what technology can do to bring education to the next level. And so that's where the title came from. And the, and the interesting thing is that in the technology space, we have evangelist as a title for a lot of things, right? So Vint Cerf, who works at Google, he's the chief internet evangelist, right? Um, uh, Guy Kawasaki at Apple was the chief technology evangelist, right? Like, so that word evangelist has been part of the technology culture for a while. So that's where it came from that, and it's kind of stuck. And, and again, it's not a, it's not a religious word. It's a, it's a, an evangelist is someone who brings good news. And that's what I think I bring is I bring good news in terms of what we can do to bring education to the next level. Cause I'm passionate about it. Mm -hmm. What is your role internationally? Mm. Okay. And I didn't answer your question about what I do. So my job at Google is actually, that's where the title came from. The job that I do is I work across, um, all the different teams that are doing things in education, right? So all the, you know, the interesting thing about Google 
is that we were involved in education since the day Larry and Sergey turned on Google.com or at the time Google.org. Because when you're searching for information, you're getting educated. And so we've been involved in education. So there's like, I don't know, I'm guessing 800 different people that are doing things in education. So my job is to be a subject matter expert to, to provide them with the subject matter expertise, to be there for meetings for them, to, to be there to have communications, to go to events and speak at events. So my job at Google is to work across all those teams and, and be a subject matter expert. But I'm also an external being in the sense that I don't work at the Google headquarters. I, I, I live and work at home in, in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't really, nobody really reports to me. I don't really report. I'm kind of this like Yoda figure at Google where I just kind of roam around. And it's, you know, it's a great role. I, you, you can't complain about the role. In terms of my, my role internationally, I, more than anything, it's, it's reactive. I get asked to speak at a lot of events on an international level by organizations that are interested in learning more about the role that technology plays, or more importantly, this next generation of students. I've, I've, I've been doing a lot of study on Generation Z and who they are. Uh, and so I've, I'm, got, I'm diving deeper into that generation, and that generation is consistent in most developing countries. It's the same kind of person, right? Because they're born into the same environments. And so I get asked to speak at a lot of events uh, on an international level. And, and so I think that, you know, if you think about where the internet is in terms of on a global scale, and this is what I'm excited about here in the U.S., is that only 50% of the world is online right now. Right. And, and I've been to some of these countries and when they say they're online, they're not really online. Right? It's like online being on an airplane online. Right. They're, it's not really online. And that's exciting because we're still ahead of a lot of this. Right. We still have an opportunity because only half of the world is online. But what is the world going to look like when 80 percent of the world is online or 90 percent? That that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, Alaska is a very. Uh, large state mm -hmm. with an extremely small population. Now, most folks live in the urban areas, which are online. I think even you uh, would say, okay, you guys in Anchorage are online. Yeah. But a lot of people live in remote places across the state that are not online. And as a result, we experience real challenges educationally in terms of healthcare and uh, uh, commerce, those sorts of things. Um, what are you seeing in uh, other rural parts of the world that uh, might apply to us here in Alaska? Yeah, that, that's, it's, it is a problem, but it's also a temporary problem and in the large scheme of things. And what I mean by that is if you think about digitalization, if you think about 1995 as the date that a new world was born, right? The digitalization economy. If you think about that and compare it to other times in history that something major like that happened, the Industrial Revolution, for example, is a, good, is a good analogy to use for this because before that we had agriculture uh, economy. When the Industrial Revolution came, they built factories. People dropped their farm equipment and moved to the cities to work in factories. Nobody requested the factories to move out into the rural areas, right? Everyone left the rural areas to go into the city because that's where their jobs were. And in this economy, that didn't happen, right? It wasn't like this digitalization thing happened. And like you said, it's in urban areas. No one is saying, oh, I need to go there to have access to that. The, the request is bring the access to me, right? So that's really what's happening. It's just gonna take longer to solve, right? It would be the equivalent of the industrial revolution of saying, yeah, that's great that you have all these factories, but build the factories out here in the rural communities, right? How long would it take to do that? Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing is happening now. I think that we are starting to see solutions. And again, this is a global problem because for us, uh, for the world, a lot of it has to do with transportation and infrastructure issues. You can't even get to some of these places. And when you get there, they don't have electricity. So some big issues when it comes to rural places around the world. But I think that, again, it's a temporary solution because you're starting to see some solutions. Like Google, that you know, this Project Loon, where we're launching balloons into space to provide internet access. Uh, other companies are launching drones into space, satellites into space. Again, these are things that are, are starting to get built. So internet access, in 1995, 1% 1 of the world was online, we're at 50%. In the US, 14% of people had uh, high-speed internet access, today it's 90%. That last 10% is hard in everything, right? And so I just think it, it, it takes longer to get there. 
Is Google a technology company or an education company? Ooh, I, no one's ever said Google's an education company. Google, Google is a, I would say Google is a problem solving company, right? I think we identify problems and then we go solve those problems to the point where we've had so many different areas to focus on that we've created this alphabet company because there were so many other ideas that had come up. So if you think about things like search, search was a solved, a solved problem when Google launched, right? There were lots of search engines when Google was launched, but there was a problem with it. And so Google, Larry and Sergey solved that problem. When Gmail was launched, Email was a solved problem. There were lots of email platforms, but Google saw a problem. You know, you can argue that transportation is a solved problem, but Google saw a problem in transportation and built, you know, self-driving cars. So I think we we look for big problems. We we use this model, which is, you know, kind of like what's the problem that you're solving? What's the big thing? What's the big X? And what is a potential radical solution to that? So internet access in rural communities. Well, the, the practical solution is let's build fiber lines all the way out to, to the rural communities that take 20 years. The impractical solution is let's launch balloons into space. So what's, what's the radical solution? What's the technology that we need for that solution, right? And so that's what Google tends to focus on in solving these big problems. So, so I think it's, you know, I would compare Google to a university, right? In terms of, you know, your university has different problems that they're focused on in research areas. You know, we have, I don't know how many PhD people we have at, at Google, but we have a lot. And so I think we're a problem solving company. So as a problem solving company and as a university in a way, as a learning organization, mm -hmm. we often use that term, I would expect that Google has a very conscious strategy for bringing people into its culture into the Google culture. How would you describe the Google culture and, and the way in which it brings people like you and, and many others uh, into, into its corporate community? Yeah, that's a great question because I think that's the hardest thing to maintain as you grow as a company. I've been there 13 years. When I started, there were roughly 4,000 people that worked there. I think we're like past 80,000 now in offices all over the world. And when I talk, and I spent, before this, I spent seven years working at Accenture in organizational development, consulting, and, and how to move things forward inside an organization. And I think that connected to that, the most important thing that Google does is the guiding principles. What are the guiding principles that you have? And those help set the stage for who you hire, how you recruit, all those types of things, but also builds their culture internally. Culture is going to change over time. It, it's just, you can't help it especially as you get bigger. But there's things that you can do, like what are the guiding, the non-negotiable guiding principles that you have? And then I think the second area that you focus on the most is interviewing, right? Hiring people. I can't believe I'm gonna admit this on camera. I hate the interview process at Google because it is so time consuming. Whenever I see it pop up on my calendar, I'm like, oh no, that because I know that I got to prepare for it. I got, I got a lot of time to spend preparing for this interview. And then there's these questions that I have to ask and I have to write down all the answers and I have to do an assessment. I mean, this, we're talking about a four or five page document for every interview that I do. And then this goes into a pile with everyone else's questions and answers. And all that gets thrown to a hiring committee who reviews it. And then that goes to another case. So it's this whole long process because we want to make sure we're bringing in the right people to work at Google. And we look for four things, general cognitive ability, and we ask questions about that, um, role-related knowledge, and questions about whether, if you wanna be in marketing, you should probably know things about marketing. Uh, then we look for what we call leadership. And really, I would, I would say leadership is really collaboration, right? Can you, can you lead, but can you also follow? Can you influence? Can you build consensus? You know, those types of things that we're looking for. And the last one, to your point, is Googliness. You know, are they a good fit? And it's not like, do they fit in our culture? But more importantly, could they, do you think they could live by our guiding principles, which are problem solving, solving problems quickly, moving fast, um, you know, not, not doing things that would be, you know, we have a lot of training professional development around making sure that we're not doing things illegally and that we're protecting our users data because security and privacy is the most important thing that we can focus on because we're one click away from being irrelevant, right? If all of a sudden you didn't trust Google, you're just gonna stop searching, 
No, you're just going to use something else. And so it's important to us. So those are the things that we look for when we hire people at Google. And I think that helps create the culture no matter where Google is. But again, it's around, and, and I think it, that's all based down, you know, that's all broken down into focusing on what motivates all of us as human beings, right? It's the same three things. No matter who you are, you're motivated by the same three things. Daniel Pink and his book Drive talks about this, and I should get a dime every time I mention his name, uh, his book, because it's the same three things. It's purpose, autonomy, and mastery, right? Those are the things that motivate all of us. And I took a pay cut to work at Google because of the autonomy piece, right? It was come to Google and solve problems, purpose, and do it in a way that you want to do it, right? And we'll give you the tools and the mastery to do that, right? That's enticing. And I think that drives people like me to an organization like Google. Very, very interesting. What is, uh, I mean, Google is a, is a leader uh, in our economy, certainly, and, and has positioned itself well to be a leader. Uh, in education, what do what's next for Google? Uh, obviously, you're not going to share proprietary right. information. That, that's completely understood. But, but in terms of the big picture, what's what's next uh, for for the company and its thinking about the future? Yeah, I think you know if if and I, again, I'm not I'm not sharing anything that's not public here. But I think that the focus and 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 Sundar has talked about this is machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I always find that word. I giggle every time I hear the word artificial intelligence because it's not intelligent at all, right? If you if you compare what we can do with technology to the human brain, I forget what the, the ratio is, but I think we're at like one one hundred thousandth of the power of a human brain, right? So we're nowhere near intelligence. But I think that space around machine learning and artificial intelligence and what we can do with that, I don't even think we scratched the surface of that potential. Everything from, you know, providing map service that that build, you know, I, it's funny, most of us who work at Google will look at technology or search or maps or anything. And if you rate, you know, if you ask us to rate it on a scale of one to 10 on how good it is, most of it, most of us will say like it's a one or a two, right? Like, why doesn't my phone know that as soon as I get to the airport and I pop open the map, why can't it tell me it, why doesn't it know where I am and know that the next thing on my calendar is to go to this hotel and instantly give me directions to that hotel, right? Why does it know that I didn't rent a car so I, and, and give me directions to where the cab stand is, right? Like, like, th like the things that are potential or possible uh, to get all that kind of information out of the way so that we can focus on creativity. There's the narrative right now that you hear in the world is, um, you know, automation robot, robots are coming to steal your jobs. I don't believe that. I don't think that that's true. And I think we've, you know, you've studied history. You know that we've heard this forever, right? Uh, I remember when, uh, you know, there, I read an article about textile workers when, when, when machines were launched and how they protested and broke machines because they were going to replace their jobs, and they did. Uh, or when uh, automation happened in building cars and, you know, machinists and, and people in the assembly line lost their jobs. Absolutely. Automation and robotics has been part of our life the whole time. But it's also created opportunity. And I don't think we pay attention to that part as much. And if you think about something like the banking industry, right, when ATMs were introduced, nobody was ever going to work in a bank again, the banking industry was done, it was all going to be automated. And well, there's more people working in the banking industry today than there were when bank ATMs were introduced, right. So it's this narrative of the world is ending because robots and automation are coming to take your job. And I think it's an opportunity to eliminate process work, eliminate work that doesn't seem necessary to focus on other types of work that align more to what motivates human beings. And I think that's exciting. Yeah, to what you said about Daniel Pink, purpose and mm -hmm. uh, autonomy and, and mastery, yeah. you know, doing some really rote bureaucratic process doesn't really uh, support those values no. that, uh, that Pink so I think well described. What um, What's next for you? What what excites you, uh, Jamie? You bring a lot of energy to your work, mm -hmm. and uh, as a education evangelist, uh, there's always there's got to be something on your horizon, or right. probably eight things on your horizon. Right. But what's out there that's that's interesting to you right now? Well, there's a couple of things, and I'm glad you asked that question because it gives me well, one. I don't think we're doing enough to capitalize on the capacity and capability that students have. I just read this fascinating article about young entrepreneurs and the barriers that they face. 
just from a business perspective, right? Like if you're 18 years old with an amazing idea, you can't even rent a car to go to a meeting, right? You can't get a bank loan. You can't, you know, you, you gotta get your mother to sign off on your bank loan for your business. Like all these barriers that young entrepreneurs have. So I just got, this actually just happened two days ago and I read this article, I'm like, there's gotta be a solution here that we can create. What kind of business needs to exist to provide young entrepreneurs with the, with the capital and the skills and the, and the resources that they need? Why do we assume that you can only be smart when you're 21 years old or rent a car when you're 20? Like wh where did that come from, right? So, I, so one thing that I'm excited about is young entrepreneurs or young people with great ideas that have a passion. Because this generation is different than previous generations. And we always say that about previous generations, but this generation is literally different because of the time that they were born into, right? This generation that's 18 years old today, the, the ones that were born around the year 2000, don't know what the world looked like before uh, Wi-Fi and tablets and laptops and Google, right? All these things that are available to them, they think about the world in a different point, from a different point of view. They are also a problem-solving generation in the sense that they've dealt with nothing but problems. Think about the fact that if you think about my 17-year-old, until very recently, maybe three years ago, he lived in a, uh, a broken-down economy, right? The world was crashing. His whole life, he's heard of the recession, the global recession and what it did, right? That's what he knows. Now, unfortunately for us, we didn't have to go through that, but lots of 17 year olds did have to go through that. They watched their parents struggle uh, and they watched their siblings go to college and then come home and live in a basement, right? They they have a different point of view of that. So they, they have that global recession economy. They are also the climate change generation, right? Where the, you know, we had, we're old enough where we had a chance to actually enjoy the world and like, oh, look, the world is cool and all these resources are available to us. They've heard nothing but the world is dying their whole life, right? They, they, they've been doing live shooter drills since they were five years old, right? This is a generation that has faced nothing but problems and problems and problems, and now they're getting to the age where they want to create solutions. And the kids in Florida are a great example of that passion and what you see there. So I think that this is a generation that is a bunch of problem solvers. So I want to focus on how do we help them? How do we not create more barriers for them and instead give them opportunity? That's one, one space that I'm interested in. The other one that I'm interested in is this idea of um, whether they're young people or, or older people that are focused on building products and solutions for people of color. And what I mean by that is the African-American market is a trillion dollar market. The Latino market is a trillion dollar market. Who's building products and solutions for those groups. And it's not gonna be a, a firm that has 99% you know, white people in it. Like that's, they're not, that's not where the solution is gonna come from. So how do we diversify those companies, number one, but also how do we create opportunities for those groups that have different ideas that might not make sense to someone who doesn't have that background or might not understand that culture. Like how do we create opportunities for that? So, so and the business side, that's what I'm interested in. And, and I've been an advisor to another, a number of companies and I'm adding some more where I can help them think about these things. Uh, and then I just launched, and this is the pitch for my YouTube channel. I just launched a YouTube channel. I had a friend of mine come up to me and I talk about this in the introduction video. He, a year ago, he said, you, uh, you, need to, you need to do more to get your message out. And, and I looked at him like, you're, I'm like, are you insane? I traveled 306,000 miles last year, right? I have all the badges of conferences that I've spoken at on my wall. And I'm like, no, I, I'm doing plenty. And he said, no, you could do more. You could reach millions more. You need to start a YouTube channel. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. And for like nine, 10 months, this thing's been eating at me. And like what he said about me not getting my message on, he was right. I go to a conference, I speak to a thousand, like I did this week in Sacramento, I talked to a thousand people, they got to hear the message, but what about everyone else? And so I, I, talk, I, I thought about this and then I thought, well, I travel a lot, why don't I do it interesting in a sense of talking about career advice and talking about things that I've learned, lessons learned, but put it on a YouTube channel where I am traveling and talking about these things at the same time. So I just, it's the hardest thing I've ever done besides teaching 10th grade communication skills. But I, I started this YouTube channel in, in, in a way to get those messages out to people who need to hear them, whether it's young high school kids or college kids or young professionals, things and lessons that I've learned, and especially for uh, kids who are growing up the way I grew up, right? This idea that if I can do these things, you can do these things too, right? So I can make, I can make one of two assumptions. Either I am some 
unbelievable super genius with a 500 IQ, and that's what my wife thinks I think, or there are millions of kids who are just like me who don't have an opportunity or don't have the luck that I had or don't have the resources, and I'm trying to provide opportunity and resources and sometimes luck, although I'd like to eliminate luck as a requirement for success. Um, I have that and I can give that to that generation, so I started a YouTube channel uh, to do that as well. Well, Jamie, thank you. Uh, your responses to, the, to these questions, the ideas you bring, and more than that, the passion you bring and the commitment you bring uh, to educating people and providing opportunity for people, uh, diverse people from all across the country and all across the world is really exciting. And we really appreciate that you took the time to share uh, those ideas and that enthusiasm with us here at the University of Alaska. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. The, the thing that I live by is that it's, it's a personal passion because it's a personal experience. I believe that education disrupts poverty, right? And, and that, that is true. It's and I get to meet thousands of people who are, who who are just like me, who come up to me after events and like, hey, I grew up just like you did, and look what I'm doing today. And that's powerful, and we don't talk enough about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.